get started. Sorry, technical difficulties. All right, it looks like we don't get audio. Um, but imagine that you're hearing the song Lights by Ellie Golding playing. Uh, this is a picture of Ellie Golding. She is uh, an international pop superstar, if you don't know her. Um, she's sold millions of records worldwide. Uh, she, I like her as a singer. I think she's amazing. Um, and this is what she had to say about that point in her life. I was scared I wasn't as good of a singer as everyone thought I was. And as the stakes grew, I was afraid of letting everyone, including myself, down. You might recognize this woman, Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook. She also wrote the book Lean In. You may have heard of that one before, too. It started an international movement, pretty famous. She said something that brings me so much back to my school days. Every time I was called on in class, I was sure that I was about to embarrass myself. Every time I took a test, I was sure that it had gone badly. And every time I didn't embarrass myself or even excelled, I believed that I had fooled everyone yet again. So one day soon, the jig would be up. Or maybe you felt like Mike Cannon Brooks. He's probably not as a familiar of a face for you, but you've probably used his products um, that he makes with Atlassian. He's one of the co-founders of Atlassian. He's a billionaire. He's the boss of 2,300 people in three countries. Sounds like he knows what he's doing, right? Um, but in his talk about imposter syndrome, he said, most days, I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm extremely aware of feeling like an imposter right now. As I'm up here, some sort of pseudo expert on a feeling I couldn't even put a name to until recently. Which, if you think about it, is kind of the point, isn't it? Yep, kind of agree with you, Mike. So what are these people talking about? They're talking about imposter syndrome and its many different flavors and coats. Um, but what exactly is imposter syndrome? It's something we hear thrown around a lot. As it turns out, there's a lot of academic research around this. It was first discovered by, um, or, or labeled by uh, Clance and Imes. Um, so Pauline, it's Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes. They initially focused on high achieving women. Their research took place in the 70s. Um, but in the past 40 years, their research has been expanded upon by many other academics. And they found that basically nobody is immune to imposter syndrome. Everybody gets it, whether you're a man or a woman, cross-culturally, people of different ages and different experience levels and different walks of life all get imposter syndrome. So there isn't really any kind of, of cultural or outwardly obvious predictor of who's gonna get it. One of the people that furthered her work was D Dina Simmons. Uh, Dina Simmons is an immigrant, she's a black woman, and she spent some time in the boarding schools and academia of the East Coast. She uh, is currently the director of the Emotional uh, Intelligence Studies Institute at Yale. And she really strongly felt imposter syndrome as both a black woman and an immigrant in these situations where she, she felt singled out. And so what she talks about is how personal history, intersectionality, the messages you receive, your culture, all of that greatly impacts your uh, feelings of imposterism. And sometimes, a lot of times, you'll feel like an imposter in one environment, but you won't feel like you're an imposter in the other environment. Um, an example that she gave in the, the interview that I listened to was she grew up in the Bronx, and the way that she spoke in the Bronx, she felt totally comfortable around you know, the, the people that she grew up around, the fa her family of origin, but as soon as she stepped into these academic settings, the way that she presented herself, the way that she felt like she looked, the way that she felt like she talked was just labeled as wrong. So this really helped her feel like an imposter, and she used that experience to kind of further this research and really make it personal and, and interesting. So if you get a chance to look into somebody, I, I really recommend you read up on Dina Simmons. But imposter syndrome, because it's so common, is not a formal diagnosis. It's not like a set of criteria that you meet. Pretty much everybody feels it at some point in their life. Um, but that's not to say it's not serious. There is no cure. <laughs> so unfortunately, it's not like you could take a pill or do these three simple things and you won't feel like an imposter anymore. It's really hard to beat, as it turns out. And you know what researchers have also discovered? You'd think that the more successful that you'd get, the less you feel like an imposter. But nope, the exact opposite. Because people who feel imposter syndrome a lot tend to seek outside validation 
when they get promotions, they worry that they have to support that promotion with additional outside validation. So what this means is when you feel like an imposter, you don't kick back and enjoy your success. Your, the high from success is less about like that. And then you're on to worrying again. So, but I'm here to tell you, you belong in tech. You belong here, I belong here. And it's time that we finally own the space that we take up and claim it because you know what? It's holding us all back that we're not uh, claiming our space and we're not being as awesome as we can be. So by the end of this talk, you should walk away with some ideas for how to own your own triumphs, learn from your mistakes, and help keep imposter syndrome at bay, both for you and maybe for some of your friends and your colleagues as well. So we've already gone into what is imposter syndrome. I figured I'd throw up a, a, an agenda in case any of you uh, had to sneak out to go to a bathroom break and there was part of it that wasn't, wasn't as compelling for some of you. Um, but yeah, we'll go over my story, some tips that I've picked up for managing imposter syndrome in myself, and also some tips for helping other people around you. We'll go over a recap, and then um, I'll show you my office hours and how to contact me. My story, story with imposter syndrome starts at the Alabama School of Mathematics and Science in the 90s in Mobile, Alabama. It was a boarding school. Um, I entered there as an 11th grader, having been there the previous summer for a website design class, and I was like fired up about technology. Um, this was a time when like there were not programming classes offered in high school. Um, you know, back in the 90s, it was so long ago. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I went there really excited about the possibility to learn more about how to program and technology. So I went in with a little bit of website design experience from summer camp. I uh, took a visual ba basic class with Ms. Ruye, which I loved and was a total blast, and I had a great time. I made a magnetic poetry application. Um, and, you know, I just, I really loved it, and I was excited about the possibility of going into it as a career. Then I signed up for Intro to Computer Science, and I had a different teacher. I was really, really struggling with the concept. I honestly, I don't even remember what language it was. I don't remember what the concept was. I just remember not getting it. I raised my hand, I asked a few questions of the teacher, which, you know, seems like normal stuff for school. His answer was to call me stupid in front of the entire class. Uh, the guy who sat next, to, sat next to me, his name is Michael Beatty. Um, he's still a friend of mine today, but he took me aside after the class, you know, diagrammed out the concept, explained it to me in about five minutes. Um, he went on to be a very successful TA, by the way. Um, but yeah, he, so even though I, I got it in a relatively short order, that seed had been planted in my head that I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't good enough to do this, and that I shouldn't be there. Around the same time, I was talking to my grandfather, who is an aeronautical engineer. My grandfather, bless his heart, is a very old-fashioned man. And when I told him that I wanted to be a computer programmer, his response was, don't do that. That's an egghead job. You're too cute. You've got too much personality. You shouldn't do that. And so the message that I received loud and crystal clear was that I didn't belong in tech. I didn't belong in engineering. I wasn't smart enough for it. I wasn't good enough, and I should do something else with my time. So I did. I went to this wonderful school, Agnes Scott. I had a lot of interests as an 18-year-old, so I thought, hey, I'm into science, and I'm also into art, and I'm into history, and I'm into literature, so I'm gonna go to a liberal arts college and figure out what I wanna do. I ended up getting an art degree, a studio art degree. The reason I chose this picture is that this is Dana Fine Arts Building. I feel like I lived in the basement of this building doing my printmaking degree here. But it was a great time. Agnes Scott prepared me really, really well for my future. They call themselves the world for women, and I, I definitely felt that when I was there. While I was at Agnes Scott, I also uh, went to Georgia Tech to hang out with some friends. Met this, this really cute guy named Alex. We started dating, we moved in together, we had a cat, we had a dog. Life was good. I graduated. We, uh, we went on a lovely trip to Florida, stayed in his dad's condo in Florida. And uh, he took me out a boat ride for, uh, excuse me, took me out for a, a boat ride for a graduation. And um, so life was good. I took a job teaching preschool. He took a job as the IT guy um, at a law firm. Oh.
Sorry about that, technical difficulties. So anyway, um, Alex took a job as, whoop, as the IT guy at a law firm. I took a job as a preschool teacher, uh, doing art and, and all sorts of cool stuff with preschool kids. And um, after you know a while, I got bored with teaching preschool, and I had like a little bit of extra time at night. So Alex was working on this game called Tetranet. I don't know if any of you played Tetranet back in the day. This was like about mm, 15 years ago. Um, it was a multiplayer online Tetris game. There was not an OS X client, so Alex decided to create one. We were both Mac geeks, very early adopters of OS X. Um, we had been playing on our MacBooks, and we were sick of like booting up in Linux and having to jump through all these hoops to basically play a video game. So we built our own. Alex did the programming, and he kept trying to rope me in and going, hey, you're good with graphic design. Why don't you uh, help me out with the buttons? And so I did, and then that turned into me testing, and then something crazy happened. I discovered that I really love testing software, and I loved finding bugs, and I'd be like, ha, got it. You know, I'd, be, I'd go home from, from my preschool job, I'd be up playing Tetranet at one in the morning with, uh, with my husband testing, um, and it was, it was great fun. And finally, through all of that, Alex was like, listen, I, I know what you've heard before in your past, but you're, you've got a knack for this. You've got a really good eye for testing. You're finding things that I, I can't find. I mean, he has been programming since he's been five, so he's very talented at it. And so I took this to heart, and um, he said, you know, you need to go out there and apply for some tech jobs. I know you're not happy teaching preschool. You have potential. We need people like you. And I was like, eh, I don't have the experience. I'll never get a job. Nobody's going to hire me. And he would not let that excuse pass. <laughs> um, and so he helped me, really did help me craft my resume and submit it to basically any job that I could find. Um, between here and there, we moved to New York City. And that's where I started my testing career. I spent about six months spamming out my resume to anybody that I could find. I probably got about... 10 job interviews out of that, and out of that, I got the one job offer that I needed to get my foot in the door. I was working for a startup called GoalQuest. It was about 30 or 40 people at the time. They don't exist anymore, as tends to happen in our world. Um, but they, it was, they made social networking sites. This was back in the MySpace days, before Facebook was around. And they made, basically, Facebook for universities and for companies and that sort of thing. So my job was basically a glorified proofreader. Uh, I would take the copy that the editor sent me, I would look at what was live on the website, make sure that it looked good in Internet Explorer, and I think Firefox were the ones at the time, um, and then give it the stamp of approval, and then it would go and get launched. Well, after a couple of months of doing this, I was also finding design flaws, and I was going and bothering the developers and being like, eh, did you notice this was a little out of line? I think it would look better if we did this, and creating problems for the people that were creating requirements. So they promoted me, <laughs> and they gave me other responsibilities. I got to do some testings for our heuristics quizzes, some of our interactive content, and that was when my job really started to get technical. But I was terrified at this job. I remember the first day I walked in, and my first stand-up was terrifying. I, you know, I had been in meetings before as a teacher, but they were always really slow, kind of leisurely affairs. We'd bring in breakfast. Everybody would have several minutes to talk and say what was on their mind and plan things and bounce ideas off of others. And you know, when you get into stand-up, it's boom, 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 boom. And I, there was all this jargon I didn't understand and all these acronyms, and I, I didn't know the client names. And I, you know, for weeks, I was going home and going, oh my god, what did I get myself into? I don't belong here. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I should have just stayed teaching, because at least I knew how to do that. Um, but you know, after a while, I made some friends. Some developers taught me some things. And I, I got my feet on the ground. Well, as soon as I got my feet on the ground, we decided that we were sick of living in New York City. It was expensive. It was turning both of us into grumps. So we moved to Chicago. Um, we applied for jobs everywhere. And uh, my husband at the time, Alex, uh, or he's still my husband, but I, he, he had moved to my husband <laughs> from boyfriend status. Um, but he got a job at Orbitz, also does not exist anymore. It got swallowed up by Expedia. Um, so we moved here. 
I kept my job back in New York City and was flying back, and after a couple of months of that, I decided that was really exhausting and I didn't want to do that anymore. So I tried to find a job in Chicago. As it turns out, it was much easier to find my job in Chicago than it was in New York. So I ended up at a place called IOCOM. I was the only woman at IOCOM. And you might think, hey, that's where you felt the most imposter syndrome. But the funny thing is that that wasn't the case there. At IOCOM, I, it was a really small company. It was founded by a bunch of people that were friends. And so the environment was really just welcoming and friendly from the second I got in there. And my boss, Mike there, was also very patient. He had also come from a liberal arts background. And so he kind of had been in my shoes, and he knew the right questions to ask. So when he was teaching me something new, he'd say, hey, have you done this before? Can I show you? Do you have any questions? And he gave me a lot of time to make mistakes, and I really appreciated that. And that one thing just really made me feel like I was part of a team and that I belonged there. Unfortunately, uh, Skype became a thing, and this was a video conferencing company. Uh, 2008 hit, and basically all of us lost our jobs on the same day. So I found myself unemployed. Um, and after a f about six months of soul searching, and again, what the hell did I get myself into? I landed a job on the QA team at Cedar City here in Chicago. Um, I was not at my most confident at this point, having worked on two failed products um, and not having a tech degree, and I was jumping into Cedar City, which was in massive growth mode at that point. They were in the Merchandise Mart, which is a nice, fancy address here for those of you who live in Chicago. And um, again, I was just nervous. I was thrown into the fire. Um, I, was one of the first, I was one of the first two QA hires there. Um, and it, it was terrifying. And again, I, saw, I found myself going, oh my god, what did I get into? Should I just go back to teaching? I'm, I'm so scared. I don't understand any of this business. Um, but again, found a friend. He helped me, he, a couple of friends actually, Sheila and a, another couple of my friends helped me out and would explain things to me. And after, you know, about six months or so there, I finally felt like I fit in, didn't feel as much like an imposter. Um, the other thing that was happening at Cedar City, though, is this is the time that test automation really started to take hold. And we were really strongly moving away from waterfall manual testing practices towards agile CI CD kind of stuff. And so I had to learn programming. I had to learn Ruby for the first time. So about a year after I started at Sitter City, I was again thrown back into this like thing where I didn't know what I was doing. It was all completely new, and I had to learn some stuff. So again, imposter syndrome hit. After I had done what I could at Sitter City, I felt like I wanted to move on to Grubhub. My boss from IOCOM had landed at Grubhub, and I wanted to go back and work with him again because it was such a good experience, and also because I love Grubhub. I have been using it. I'm an, an avid uh, orderer of delivery food. And so I was really like, awesome. I get to you know, you work on a product that I actually use like every week. And so it was great. Um, but I somehow convinced them that I was good at test engineering and test automation and SQL and stuff. So they put me on the most hardcore technical projects. Um, I was doing things like, uh, testing and proofreading these three, four, five page long SQL queries. I was uh, working on ETL jobs that were doing things in AWS that hadn't been done before with S3 and Lambda and Hive. Um, I, you know, what else was I doing? I, we, we built another um, web application and I was having to use new test automation tools to test that. In the process of all this though, I found something like $8 million of discrepancies in some of their financial reporting, which it was like a penny here, a penny there, added up to a lot of money over many years. And so that was one of the feathers in the cap. That was when I was finally like, I see what I'm doing, I see that I'm providing value, and I see that I'm fixing things, and that feels really good. Um, so, you know, again, I found an ally. I got some confidence up here. Imposter syndrome wasn't quite as bad here as it was at my previous jobs, but I was still on shaky ground learning lots of new things. But, you know, along the way, I managed to pick up some really great skills. I picked up some Python. I picked up some experience with uh, AWS. And that kind of stuff helped me down the road. I didn't know it then that it was going to help me for my next two, three jobs, but it did. So, after Grubhub, I landed a job at Emmy Solutions managing the QA team. This was an upward move. I really wanted to, to be a manager. Um, 
by this time, I had finally figured out that there is a pattern to my behavior when I was starting jobs. And so when I started this job and I started to go, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm managing people. I've never managed people before. I could go, it's okay, you're learning. You've learned things before. You can do this, you've got this. And so I, you know, about this time is also when I started to journal and when I started to really get serious about my mindfulness meditation. And those helped me immensely. It really helped me focus, it helped me keep my calm, it helped me uh, keep grounded and live in the moment. Um, and it, I was able to focus my thoughts and uh, really reflect on my successes. And this is the, the point where I feel like I, I kind of won the, the battle against imposter syndrome. Like I feel like it was a tug of war and I kept losing and finally I was able to pull towards my side. Um, you know, a funny thing happened then. People started looking up to me. People started asking me questions. I got confidence. I spoke with confidence. Um, I noticed that coworkers were asking me for help and questions where they weren't before. I began giving tech talks to the team. Um, that turned into me giving presentations at conferences. And, you know, I, I finally got comfortable with, with loudly and, and confidently saying when somebody had a problem that I didn't know how to solve, I'd say, I, I don't know how to fix it, but let's figure it out together. Where do you think we should start? And it, it really changed my mind, realizing that not everybody has all the answers. We're all just kind of fumbling and figuring our way out. And the, the secret is collaborating, asking for help, admitting where your holes in your knowledge are so that you can level up and get better. Another thing I started doing is I started talking with the people that I managed about imposter syndrome. I started recognizing the symptoms in themselves. Um, they, I really, I think, I hope, through talking with them about uh, their own imposter syndrome, that I helped them cope with their own feelings. Also gave them some ideas for how to get through it. So, now I'm at Slalom, um, and I'm happy to say that I walked into Slalom confidence, and then got client fired at my first gig because I didn't know enough. <laughs> um, I couldn't pick up the tech quickly enough. But it wasn't, it, it didn't you know, cripple me the same way that it did before. Um, and learning how to manage it really has been key to my success as a solution architect at Slalom. I've been there for about two and a half years now, and I don't have the luxury anymore of slowly ramping up and getting comfortable. They pay us a lot of money to come in, build a solution, and get out as quickly as possible. We're like a SWAT team for, for building high-tech software. So if I was worried about what I was doing, if I didn't know how to quickly figure out what I didn't know and get help with it, I don't think I would be able to, I don't think I'd be here at Slalom today. So learning how to, how to beat imposter syndrome really has helped me you know, find a job that I love and gain some confidence in it and get to the point where I'm up here on the stage talking to y'all today about it. So now that you've heard my story, let's go over some tips for how you can kick imposter syndrome in the butt. So um, we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go over some things, like I said, that you can do yourself, and then we're gonna take a step back because of Dina Simmons' research, where she says, "Hey, environment is so important." I thought it was it was key to go over some ways that we can help fix imposter syndrome for other people as well. So the first point point that I have is to consider the messages that you have received in your life. Think about your culture. Think about your upbringing. Think about things that your coworkers and your bosses and your parents have said to you, and realize that you are not anybody's worst opinion of you. You're not your worst mistakes. You are, in fact, your successes. Your career is going to be a long, long path, and it's strongly influenced by what, what you heard before now and who you, were, who you were before today. So, you know, like I said, Dina Simmons, she wants us to ask, what is the an environment doing to create this? You know, my environment created this feeling in me that I, I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't good enough, that I couldn't do this. And if I had listened to that, and if I had only observed that message, then I would not be in tech right now. Um, so, let's see, sorry. The other, the other point that I have for you is to document, 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 document. Create lots of documents over time. This is something that takes years, I'm not gonna lie, but you know, every journey starts with a small step. And it doesn't have to be, like when I think documentation, I think of very dry technical how-to documents and wikis and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be that. 
It can be a sketchbook. It can be, you know, one of those journals with prompts. You can do videos, um, whatever. My personal favorite is a just old-fashioned notebook and, and a pen. I really enjoy writing, and so I keep that next to my bed, and I also have a little bullet point journal that I keep. The bullet point journal is in uh, the cloud, it's in Google Drive, and what I do is when I wrap up a project or I do something successful, I'll put a little you know, bullet point on my list. This helps me keep my resume up to date. Uh, it probably reads a lot like my LinkedIn profile or resume would, but it also gives me like a, a very easy to read timeline of the successes that I've had and the things that I've accomplished so that I can look back at it and go, huh, you know, I didn't just get this job by blind luck and convincing somebody that I know something that I don't. I got this job because I did these 10 things before. And they think that because I did these 10 things before, I can do these three things now. So that's been really helpful for me. Um, the, the second journal that I keep by my bed has also been more, has been helpful as well because it's more of like a, you know, it's what you would consider a traditional journal to be. I record everything that's important in that journal. So if something great happens in my personal or work life, it goes in that journal. If something terrible happens in my personal or work life, it goes in that journal. I write about my fears, my joys, my dreams, my successes in this journal. What this does is it allows me to see when I reflect back on it and read through it that my life is, is a journey, right? And the things that I was worried about five years ago, I don't even remember now, right? I was looking through uh, my journal and I found something where I had inherited a, a test framework that was, I felt like was not great. I was seriously, seriously worried that I was not going to be able to stand this thing up. And um, you know, now, five years later, I actually did the thing. We made it better. And I was able to go, oh yeah, the stuff that I learned doing that project helped me become the test architect that I am today. If I hadn't had those struggles with that, there's no way I'd be able to do my job now. So that's been really good for me too. The other thing too is it makes you, when I, when I go back and read about how proud I am that I got a promotion, how proud I am that I won an award or that I achieved my degree, it fills me with this sense of hope. It makes me realize that if I'm struggling with something right now, it's temporary and that there's gonna be success ahead, right? So again, create your own documents. While we're on the topic of reflecting on my journal, I think that reflecting on your path is key. While a journal is a great tool to do this, it doesn't have to be in a journal. Um, one of the things that I love doing is just going out for a walk. When things feel overwhelming or I'm faced with a new, new problem and I'm not sure how to solve it, and I, I get like that, I get inside my head, I just take a deep breath, I go and I take a walk and I think about the last success that I had at work or I think about the last time that I tried to solve a problem, how did I break it down, who did I go to for help? And that kind of resetting and just taking in some fresh air and walking around the city really does kind of help me, you know, reflect on my path a little bit and help me uh, center myself. Um, you, you know, that's not the only way to do it. You could also grab coffee with a mentor or a friend. You could take a look at your resume from, from you know, the bottom up and go look at your path and go, wow, I started doing this and now I'm here. I certainly couldn't have gotten here unless I had made these mistakes along the way, and, and look at who I am now, I'm a great person. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways but it, that you can do this, but I, I really strongly encourage you to take time to sit with your thoughts and think about your past, because it's really easy to get caught up in your challenges now and not think, hey, I've overcome this stuff before. The other tip that I have, speaking of mentors and friends, is to build your squad. I've got some of my squad here today with me. <laughs> um, and your squad doesn't necessarily have to be people that know each other and are buddies. I'm not talking about like some entourage or sex in the city thing. I'm talking about just people that have you in mind and your success in mind and want to see you do well. Um, you know, it's people that you feel like are your cheerleaders. That's why they're your squad. People that you can go, eh, I really feel nervous about this one thing, can, can you help me get through this? Um, so who's on my squad? My mom is of course on my squad. She's the first person I call, like, ah, mom, I need help. She doesn't know anything about tech, but she's very good at talking me down. Uh, like I said, my husband, Alex, is on my squad. Anshul is one of the people on my squad over here. Uh, we used to work together. Um, 
I've got a, you know, a bunch of former coworkers that are on my squad, uh, a couple of cur current allies at my office that are on my squad. Uh, I have a Moms in Tech Facebook group that I love. They're a great group of people. I love bouncing ideas off of them. Um, and I have a couple of mentors as well who, are, who I think are on my, my squad. Um, but really the important thing is that there, you know, it's people that you can go to for advice and people who can keep you grounded and, and can also give you constructive feedback and help you see the big picture, right? The other point that I have, and this is probably the biggest thing for me that, that helped beat my imposter syndrome, is to mentor or teach somebody. Like, get out there and, and share your knowledge because there is nothing as validating as having people look up to you. Plus, you get to reinforce the knowledge that you already have when you teach somebody else. Uh, I grew up in the Montessori system. Um, I was a Montessori teacher back when I was a preschool teacher, so I really believe in the, the value of teaching your peers and your peers teaching you. Um, you know, I also spent some time doing some volunteer work with sixth to eighth graders, uh, teaching them some computer science project, pro, uh, com some computer science projects and code. And that is also really super inspiring. Man, you think you don't know anything about technology? If you go volunteer with a bunch of kids who really do know nothing about technology and they're just all ideas, you get to help bring those ideas to life. And it's, it's really inspiring and it fills you with hope for the future. So those are some of the things I've learned to help me manage imposter syndrome. So let's talk about what we can do as a community to help banish imposter syndrome among our friends and our colleagues so that we can all do the most awesome work that we can. Seriously, mentor or teach somebody. <laughs> this is the, the easiest thing that you can do, right? Um, share, share something online. Find somebody who doesn't know what you do. My call to action to you, if there's any one thing you do and you get out of this speech, I want you to go home, leave this conference, and find somebody to mentor or find a volunteer opportunity to teach. We need more awesome people in tech, and the only way we're gonna get there is if we pull them in and rise them up with us. So please, get out there, mentor, or teach. The other thing, I'm sure you've all heard the saying, be the change that you want to see in the world. You've probably heard that attributed to Gandhi. That's a lie, it's not Gandhi. It's, uh, he said something similar to it, but not really quite that. But the point remains, it's, it's still a good thing. Build, the, build an attitude of inclusion. Again, going back to Dina Simmons' work, she talked about how her blackness was used against her, about how people, when she was saying, can I ask you something, her teachers would correct her, and that made her feel like less of a person. Like, do we really need to be correct all the time? No. What we need to do is we need to build an attitude and an environments of inclusion. And when we do this, people can show up to be their authentic selves. So, what does this mean? It can mean something as simple as maybe instead of doing a group happy hour, you do a group lunch instead, so that the people with kids in the suburbs can still be there and not have to sacrifice time with their kids, and so the people who don't enjoy drinking alcohol don't feel pressure to drink alcohol, right? Um, you can just be curious and be interested in the things that make the people that you work with themselves. You know, we are all diverse, rich, interesting people, and if we are convinced that, you know, our way of things is the right way of doing things, we miss out on a lot of really awesome lessons from the people that we work with and share space with. So try to build an attitude of inclusion, be mindful of your words, be mindful of your actions, and try to really make everybody feel welcome and included in your group. Another thing that I have, and I kind of touched on this a little earlier, is don't be a naysayer. Nobody likes working with that person who's always shooting people's ideas down, right? And I think we've all been in that spot. We're all, we're all QA engineers, right? Where we've been, I've had like a great idea and a developer is like, no, that won't work and here's why. And like, they don't even think about it. Like, they don't even give two minutes to think about it and think about why this would be a good idea. That is incredibly deflating. And that is one of probably the things that has fueled my imposter syndrome the most as a quality assurance engineer and working with really talented rock star developers. I'm seeing lots of heads nodding out there too, so I know that I'm not alone in this. Don't be that person, right? Just listen to ideas. Not all ideas are great, but that doesn't mean that you can't listen to them and consider them. It doesn't mean you can't learn things, you know? Sometimes you learn things in considering bad ideas. It, 
it really validates the, the direction that you're taking instead. Have discussions about this stuff. Don't just be a naysayer, be a yaysayer, right? Validate good ideas when you hear them too. If somebody says something that you go, that would be awesome, say that. Not everybody knows that everybody agrees with them. And sometimes just adding that voice to the chorus going, yeah, I think that's a good idea, helps build consensus and helps bring those naysayers onto to the side of the yaysaying, right? So the other final point that I have is to talk about it. That's what I'm here doing right now, right? I talked about it with lots of my coworkers. Um, and, and you know, I'm gonna use Anshul as an example. Um, she told me that she was having a hard time with imposter syndrome, um, and we, she had achieved this really awesome uh, goal of reaching 100 automated tests for our flagship product. They weren't perfect, some of them were still broken, but they were tests, and they were giving us information, and so I threw her happy hour, because this is something we had never been able to accomplish before. And even as we were going into the happy hour, she was like, I don't know, you know, I think this is a mistake, this isn't that big of a deal, but I think that finally, when we threw that happy hour and our coworkers were like, hey, high five, good job, patting her on the back and saying cheers with her, I think that it finally sunk in that what she had done was awesome. It was a good accomplishment and it was worth celebrating. So talk about your own struggles, but also celebrate the successes that you see of people around you. It's really, really important. So, you've heard all about my story, so let's review. What is imposter syndrome? We went over what Clance and Imes discovered in the 70s. We talked about how Dina Simmons has furthered some of her research. And we talked about how if you're more successful, it actually kind of helps fuel your imposter syndrome, which is kind of counterintuitive. I shared my story with you. I shared some of the messages I received from my family growing up. I received how I, I shared how I felt it at school um, and in, in my workplace. Then I also shared some of the breakthroughs and my aha moments that I had with imposter syndrome and how I tried to beat it. And then I went over some tricks for, tips and tricks for how you can beat it yourself, including considering the own messages that you get from your family and from society. I encourage you to document and, ref, and reflect on your journey. And I also encourage you to build your squad. So go out there, find your supporters, build your squad. My final, finally, we touched on some ways to help others. Again, the call to action, mentor or teach. Go find that out. If you don't know how to do it, come to me and I'll help you find somebody. Uh, also, we talked about how to be the change that you want to see in the world by being curious about others' ideas, by uh, celebrating successes, and by talking about your own experiences with the imposter syndrome. So that's all that I have for you today. If you have some questions about what I went over, um, we're going, I have office hours from 1 to 1.30 today. Your office hours are over here in this corner. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Evil Dork Girl. Uh, I'm on GitHub as Elock. Yeah, I've actually had that screen name since I was, since before boarding school. So that, that's a very near and dear thing to me. Um, I'm on GitHub as Elock. I think I have like two gists there. Most of my work on GitHub is private. And you can always drop me an email at my work email. Um, and if working at Slalom sounds like something that's interesting to you, come talk to me again. We're pretty much always hiring across the entire country. So thank you very much, and I hope that you guys get out there and kick imposter syndrome butt. <laughs>